Welcome to B2B Marketers on a Mission, a podcast for change makers where we question the conventional, debunk marketing myths, provide actionable tips, think differently, disrupt industries, and take your marketing to a new level. From improving your campaigns to making you a better marketer, these are the inspirational stories that will help us change the way we think and approach B2B marketing one conversation at a time. This podcast is brought to you by I'm Blake Consulting, helping you to stand out in the market and drive revenue to your B2B business. And now your host, Christian Klepp. Okay. Welcome everyone to this episode of B2B Marketers in the Mission. This is the show where we help you to question the conventional, think differently, disrupt your industry, and take your marketing to new heights. This is your host, Christian Klepp, and today I am joined by someone on a mission to help, let me see if I get this right, to help create quality B2B content that is interesting, insightful, and tells a compelling story that resonates with your target audience. So coming to us from Atlanta, Georgia, Chris Raposo, welcome to the show. Thank you, Christian. I'm humble to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Great to be connected, Christopher. And uh, before we start, shout out to Rob Conlon. Thank you so much, sir, for making this connection. Right? Okay. So Fantastic. So, Chris, um, let's kick off this conversation. And I'm going to start with a quote from an article I read in Forbes. And I think I did share that with you. And it was written by a gentleman called Samuel Timothy. Right? So yeah. his quote was, if you manage to tell a good story about your product or service, you'll be able to communicate its value without listing all the features explicitly and clients will love it. Over to you, your thoughts and what would you add to that? Uh, I'll start off with a quote as well from our company founder who says, fall in love with the market, not the idea. Okay. So too often entrepreneurs or business people or marketers, they fall in love with that grandiose idea of that product that they have without um, getting the input from the market and to see if they actually would utilize that product. Right. Uh, we're all familiar with the, with the movie field of dreams or many of us are you know if they build it they will come but rarely in the real world does that actually work that you just build a product and then people are just going to flock to it uh it's not like the iphone right that doesn't happen very often um so we got to make sure we think market first not idea first um be ingrained in the market just get to know the market it's like when you go on a first date right you're not asking somebody to marry you on the first date you get to know them you court them and you want to do the same with the with your market with your audience to know what they really want and once you really know what they want what triggers them and what they're attracted to then you'll be able to tell a story after you build the trust that they need from you without having to hard sell them on your features or the benefits you'll have the connection, you have that trust, and then um, the story will flow organically um, when it comes to your product. That's what I would say. Absolutely, absolutely. And yes, indeed, um, build it and they will come uh, is probably one of the biggest uh, misconceptions of our time. Um, I love how you uh, talked about building trust because, wow, in B2B, it's uh, it almost seems like it's obvious, but it's interesting to note how many... Um, companies and uh, marketers for that matter uh don't lead with that right yeah they might they might have it in the mix somewhere somehow but they don't lead with it and that's that, that's a dangerous path to go down if you don't if you don't lead with trust right yeah i'm a big fan of social proof mm. you know if you have great customers you know make sure you have those case studies those customer spotlights even yeah. the employee spotlights you know uh People do business with people, so you want to make sure that even if it's B2B marketing, that your customers and your clients, they get to know you and your um, your employees that they're going to be dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. Absolutely. Okay, Chris, uh, you know, we're focusing on the concept of um, storytelling for B2B, and we have had guests on the show um, previously that have talked about this topic, but I think... One of the reasons why I thought it would be interesting to um, have a conversation with you is because 
one of the things that I like about this show is um, we encourage diversity of thinking. So people can come and talk about the same topic, but offer their own perspective. And that perspective, more often than not, there, there are some commonalities, but they also tend to be very different um, perspectives, which are all uh, very meaningful and constructive. So on that note, on to the next question. Talk to us about some of the things that you've seen from your own experience, some of the common mistakes, and we spoke about misconceptions already, mistakes and misconceptions that you've seen out there with regards to B2B storytelling and what you think should be done to address these. One of the problems is that I've seen, and that's happened to me too when somebody's trying to pitch me, is that companies make it about themselves, make it about their product, and we just have to realize that it's not about us, right? Especially in this connection economy uh, that we're working in these days. We always want to make sure it's about the customer. It's about the market. It's about the client. And we want to bring value to them, right? This is like the service industry. We're here to serve them. They have an issue. They have a problem. And our products are there to address that problem, to help them, to lift them up. So... When you tell a story, uh, when you tell it to your customer, you always want to make sure you make them the hero in the end, right? So if it's a B2B VP of marketing and they're needing a content management system or anything to help them get better reach or get more leads or more signups for whatever they're doing, um, you want to make sure that they look good in front of their stakeholders when they decide to go with our product. So even though we have a great product that will help them we don't want to make us look like their savior, right? We want to take it around and put, put the focus on them, make them the hero. So our product is the solution to their problem, and we want to help make them shine. And uh, I'm a big follower of Simon Sinek. So you always want to make sure you start with why, right? Why is this product there? Why are you getting up in the morning? Is it to simply make a lot of money, or is it to solve a problem? You know, it's better to give than receive. You know, that's my uh, motto that I live by daily. Um, and our company, for example, we serve higher ed institutions. And higher ed institutions, they serve the next generation of leaders, right? And we help them with their messaging on their website. So if we do a good job and if we're able to reach them to help them build a better website that attracts um, better future leaders and equips them, you know, we're doing a good job to help uh, better our our nation, even if we're not directly involved in the teaching, but we're helping those higher institutions get in front of those students that need to hear about them and their service. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I love that you brought that, um, that quote up from Simon Sinek about starting with why. I wanted to go back to something you said earlier, and it's something that I... Uh, I encourage guests that come on the show to explain in greater detail because you talked about bringing value to customers and we all know that. And you probably see this on LinkedIn more often than you care to count, but people talk about, oh, add value, bring value. And you know, you have to, you have to uh, show your value in your own words, define what you mean by value. Value means that I'm able to equip someone to be a better version of themselves and show them that they can do more. Like sometimes we have this, this ceiling that we think, okay, we can't go past that. But if we bring them a product that would help them elevate to break through that ceiling to the next level, that's the sort of value that I'm talking about. Fantastic. Fantastic. All right. On to the next question. Love it or hate it, but this is extremely important when it comes to good storytelling. Explain the relevance of first party data and research. Yes, definitely. Um, so where I went to school, the uh, communications college, journalism college at the University of Florida, they're big on um, primary research. To, so we learn a lot about that. And primary research or first party data, it helps marketers create a more purposeful message to build a direct relationship with your audience. Um, so as a marketer, you want to be super in tune and close to your sales team and your customer success team. So in tech, there's a lot of customer success teams that um, that I've heard of, and we have a great customer success team where I work and they do check-in calls with the customers to see, you know, 
are they getting the most out of their subscription? And then uh, our um, success team, they write up a recap of all the um, conversations that they have with clients, what's going well, what's not going well, what the client would like to see uh, updated in the product in order to help them even more. So we have a big shout out to Charlie and Rebecca on our success team. They're a phenomenal team and they always help me become a better storyteller because I, I, I hear about that itch that our customer has. And if I know that I'm able to scratch that itch with a compelling copy, may, may that be a FAQ or a short form video series on how to do certain things with our product, right? So you want to have that first party data directly from our clients, because chances are that if they're in the same industry as a prospective client, those prospective client, they're probably dealing with the same issues. So you'll be able to um, write up case studies, write up customer success stories or customer spotlights to showcase, hey, somebody in your position had that issue and that's how they overcame it. And it's instant social yeah. proof again, right? Yes. Instant social proof right there. Absolutely, absolutely. Identifying, um, you know, to your point, what's keeping the customer up at night, and not even, not even necessarily just that, but like, what is it that they need to do, um, or in order to succeed in their role, in their job, and if you can help them to get there, right? What a yeah. compelling story that would make, right? Fantastic, exactly. fantastic. Back to bringing value, you know. Yes. Yes, indeed, indeed. You brought up something earlier and I'd like to go back to it. It's about video series or just the concept of videos in general. Um, we all know that it's becoming more and more important in the world of content. Um, you know, from your point of view and from where you sit in the B2B content marketing space, um, how important are videos in your in your work? Uh, it's immensely important, especially, uh, you know, everybody loves TikTok, or at least the Gen Z generation. I'm not on TikTok, but yeah. I love YouTube. I love YouTube shorts, bite-sized um, instructional videos, or even uh, videos that entertain me. Um, but I believe that videos are the future in marketing because people are always on the go. And if you can just, like this podcast, for example, if you can just listen to it on your commute uh, to and from work, or if you're doing the dishes or folding the laundry, whatever it is, um, you don't have to watch it, but at least you have the audio. So video is huge. Or for example, when I need to fix something in my house, and I don't know how to do it. I don't Google it. I go to YouTube and I, I, I search for it to see, hey, can somebody show me how to do this real quick? Um, and also, you know, since we were children, we were conditioned to sit in front of the TV. So a screen, you see a screen, you're like, hey, I, I want to pay attention to this. Right. And it's the same with video. That's why we're so drawn to uh, to videos. And I think that's why video marketing or advertising is so effective. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Uh, I mean, I'm ashamed to say that every time and you can appreciate this living in the United States, but every time we have to, you know, there's daylight savings time and you have to adjust the time on your watch. And I've got a G-Shock. And every time it comes to the date where I have to change the time, I'm like, oh, man. Am I, am I really going to read through this 40 page manual? No, I'll just look it up on YouTube. Right. And there you go. I, um, there was one the other, the other day I saw, like, it's like 56 seconds. Bam. There you go. Yes. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> um, on to the next question, which is one of those things, you know, where people say, oh, you don't need this in, in B2B marketing because B2B marketing is all factual and information, but I'm going to throw this out there anyway. What role do you think emotions and rationale play when it comes to storytelling in B2B? Yeah, it all, I guess it depends on the on the product that you're buying. Right? Right. Let's say a customer decides to buy um, an enterprise level software that's going to cost them a tremendous amount of money, um, you know, to run their infrastructure. They they have to be rational in their decision making. They can't just buy on impulse because in our wrong decision could put the company's future in a in jeopardy or you know and as a follow-up cost that person's job if they're just aloof and just you know jump on anything that kind of you know excites them right away so you have to be rational when you make decisions 
So let's say somebody identifies a problem and they do their research to their solution, right? Even though they're rational, they're, they're doing their research through um, to find a solution, but then you come in with your storytelling and you bring that emotion in to just convince them of their, you know, their issue can be solved while they're doing their research. Let's say through, uh, again, I always go back to the social proof because I'm just so, such a big uh, fan of it with the case studies and the customer spotlight. So they're, they're rationally looking for reviews. They're looking for some sort of an example of how somebody had the same issue and how they overcame it. And when they evaluate their options, you want to be top of mind. You want to stand out with, with your emotional storytelling abilities when you tell the customer success stories or the customer spotlights, how a different, let's say universities, because we deal with universities, overcame a certain challenge. If I may, I had a, I wrote up a customer spotlight about a Canadian school, um, University of Alberta, and they have a lot of international students in China. And in order to communicate with them, they use Google Forms, but Google has been blocked in China, so they could no longer utilize the Google Forms to communicate with their Chinese um, international students to make a smooth transition to their Alberta campus. So they used our CLI forms, our personalization tools, our forms in order to what I called penetrate the great firewall of China. So I wrote a story about that, how they did that and how they were able to bring those Chinese students over to uh, Canada and then bring it from the airport to campus, right? Bring that emotion in uh, to show them, hey, they are there, not just for the tuition, they are there to bring a good experience. So people go about it when they look for a product in a rational way, but then they get swayed kind of by the emotional storytelling part of it. That's what I believe yeah. should answer your questions, I hope. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that, that that's a great example, by the way. And uh, yeah, they I have heard it being called that. It's the Great Firewall of China or the Firewall, right? I, I was talking about it in another podcast, but you know, it's it's not a physical wall per se, right? It's actually a it's actually an entire ecosystem, if you will. It's a combination of legislation. Um, there's definitely a software and a um, censorship apparatus in place, so it's a combination of all of these these elements, right, that make that um, censorship, but like, great, great example of what was clearly an impediment, right, mm -hmm. and how they overcame that by just using another channel or using another alternative, using another approach, right, fantastic, yeah. fantastic, and with that story, that's a great segue into the next question, because, um, you know, break it down for us, just think of this like, like uh, Lego blocks, and then you just, you're just taking them apart to show us the pieces, right, so, and from your perspective, what do you think is required for effective storytelling in B2B? And you have mentioned some of them already. Yeah, you have to know your audience. You have to know them deeply. You have to know how to build your personas um, in order to know how to talk to the individual. You know, what's important to them? What you mentioned, what keeps them up at night? What are they worried about? You know, um, what do they care about? And then you want to tailor your message to their needs. Um, but you also have to understand that not every story resonates with everyone. You know, you may have different personas. For us, for example, our target audiences are VPs and CMOs of marketing, but also IT directors. Now, if I share a story about how to effectively create content with an IT director, he couldn't care less. He's worried about um, security, system security, right? So I have to tailor that message for that particular person in that way. Or if it's a web developer that we're trying to um, engage, we have to show them that they can use different um, coding languages, um, that they're not just, that they don't just only have to use XTML or CSS. They have different options with our product so that they that they know what, they, what to expect if they um, go with our product. And you also... And I said this before, make existing customers the hero, you know, tell their story, how they overcame a certain challenge uh, that they faced before. So I think that's the way to effectively tell a story in B2B marketing is always go back to the social proof and just give examples, you know, show, don't tell, I would say, show people, this is what our product did for somebody else that was in your position. 
And that's where you can be if you go with our product. Absolutely, absolutely. No, that was a great list. Um, I'd like to throw uh, one other element in there. It's um, absolutely like um, knowing your target audience, I think is paramount. Um, the other one is what, what I've seen in my own experience is understanding their buyer's journey, right? Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. what they go through, which touch points to them are critical. And then going back to your all uh, your overall storytelling slash content strategy and understanding how that content will influence their journey and move them along essentially, right? That's right. Yeah. Okay, great. So Chris, um, one of the things I, I told you in a previous conversation is that this show is about actionable tips. So we get to the point in the show where you give us something actionable. And let's uh, let's let's appreciate that you can't do all of this like, you know, in, in five minutes, all right? But what are some things, let's say three to five things that you hope uh, the audience will walk away with and that they can do right now to improve their storytelling approach? Off you go. Off you go, man. I'll give you one thing. Go to Jad GPT. Ask <laughs> Jad GPT. Let's give you a laundry list. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I, would say, yeah. I don't know when somebody's watching this episode but jet gpt is huge right now everybody's talking mm. about it in uh, yes. march 2023 so i don't know if that's still going to be relevant by the time mm. somebody's listening to this but um i would say if you only have an hour today i would suggest somebody go to ted watch a ted talk on uh, on storytelling that's how i learned about storytelling i recommend one by david phillips the the magical science of storytelling which currently has about four to five million views on youtube it's really practical and, and and help somebody you know tell better stories and then right after that probably a lot of people that listen to this podcast they've been in the industry for a while they know their audiences and i would just say like we talked earlier about short form videos you know you don't need a big production just prop up your smartphone tell a compelling story in 59 seconds or less and upload it to your youtube shorts and see what happens and experiments with experiment with that it's what i've been doing lately just trying my hand on youtube shorts and it's fantastic reach there um, because it's popular right now another thing if you have about a week or so i would say pick up the the book storytelling animal by jonathan gottschall i don't know if you heard of this one before but that was recommended by one of my mentors to me who's an extremely great storyteller and great presenter and it's just this book the storytelling animals it just explains the um life's complexity um of social problems that are brought out through storytelling and then i would just say sit with your sales team and your customer success team you know figure out what worries your customers and how your product can help them and then use that information to craft your your stories going forward and then practice 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 you know you have to sit down and you have to create videos it's super awkward at the beginning when you hear yourself talk or see yourself on video but the more you do it the easier it gets and the same with um writing compelling stories story articles um if you sit down the first time it you're like oh my gosh i don't know what to write um, or you think in your own head that it's a terrible way you just crafted a story but I always say write for one person right you don't you don't want to write for everyone I say if your piece or your content helps one person you know then your job was well done if you affect somebody out there that you may never get in contact with they may read your content on LinkedIn and they may never like it, comment, or reach out to you, but it may have affected them positively. And if you do that as a storyteller, uh, job well done. Yeah, those are some really great tips. And uh, you know, to your point, uh, one one of the clients I got like about a year ago was somebody that never engaged with the content, my content on LinkedIn. So uh, you know, it's just a message to um, you know the listeners out there: never underestimate uh, people that you know. They don't comment, they don't share, they don't engage with your content. It doesn't mean that, you know, just because they don't do that, that, that doesn't mean that they're not reading it, right? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. And that so, can be uh, frustrating at times, you know, if you like, if you think you have a great piece and then you don't get that feedback, but again, you do it for that one person, you may never know who it is. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Um, so you brought up um, a couple of great uh, examples already, but um, give us another one. Give us an example, uh, you know, from your point of view, an example of great storytelling in the world of B2B. I did a little bit of a thought about that question mm -hmm. quite a bit. And I um, there was one commercial by Salesforce, Team Earth, it's called. Oh, no, it's actually called the New Frontier. It was a Super Bowl commercial in 2022. And it was pretty timely because it was during a time where there was some turmoil in the United States, you know, lots of conflict, interracial conflict, and a lot of tension uh, between different groups. And so the, the commercial shows uh, Matthew McConaughey in, an, in a hot air balloon um, on the edge of space. And you're talking about the new frontier, space is the new frontier. And he's like, you know what? I, I don't think so. And then, um, you know, I can, uh, let me look up the script here real quick, what he says. He says, um, you know, it's not time to escape. It's time to engage with other people because um you know of the of the turmoil that we had it, you know he says it's time to to plant more trees it's time to build more trust you want to build more trust with each other because um and i don't want to get political here but it doesn't start in washington in the united states it starts in our neighborhoods it starts in our households it starts in our companies right in order to get along with each other we don't want to look at somebody that we'll never see, we'll never talk to. We we want to make sure we um we we communicate with each other and that we just build that trust and get to know each other. And that's what this commercial basically talked about. It's like it's it's time to make more space for all of us, you know, be more inclusive. And you know, so while others look at the metaverse or go to Mars, and it was also during the time when Jeff Bezos and Branson, you know, they did their space. Um Base travel, it's he said it's time to stay here and restore ours, our world, right? It's time to blaze our trail. Because the new frontier, he says it ain't rocket science. The new frontier is right here. And it was through Salesforce, you know, our CRM where you always, you know, make connections with others. So I thought it was a really uh timely message to what was going on in our world and how to connect with one another. And that's basically what Salesforce does. You know, it's, it was a great storytelling there in their way to to bring out the emotions as well as they as they, you know, shot that commercial uh, for their CRM. Yeah, yeah. Uh, perfect example. And what a great message. I mean, like, you know, to your point, it was uh, it was timely. It was pertinent. And it's uh, it's really driving that message home about like, stop looking up, at, you know, up there and, and look down here instead. We've got plenty going on down here. Right, <laughs> that we can that we can be paying attention Definitely. to, and that we should be paying attention to. Yeah, no, mm -hmm. fantastic yeah. example. Um, on to the next question: love it or hate it. You're right, but at some point in time, as marketers, right, we can come up with creative campaigns and we can come up with amazing content and videos and what have you. But at some point in time, we're going to have to show proof to someone higher up yeah. that all the stuff that we're rolling out is working. Right. So from your point of view, what specific metrics should marketers be paying attention to when it comes to B2B storytelling? Yeah, um, I'm a big fan of Google Analytics. I look mm -hmm. at it all the time, especially my blog page, you know, because I put a lot of content on my blog, see what resonates. I just I say with the videos, with the short form videos, you know, who's looking at it? Do I get engagement through it? Um, do people watch my videos? Do people stay long enough on my on my blog? To actually read the whole thing or do they just stay there for five ten seconds and then bounce because it's not relevant to them and then with that data you know what 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 sparks someone right and then you can hone in on that it's like an a b test you want to make sure that you create content that speaks to your to your um your audience i always like to put a call to action at the end of my blog posts you know if i get a if i get a, a demo request then i know it worked um, so that's something I will always want to look at. What else? Let's be honest. Um, we talked about this a little bit earlier with lurkers on social media. So a lot of people they don't look at they don't engage with their stuff, but I still look at it. You know, do people share my content? Do people like it? So a couple of weeks ago, I created a 10 must listen higher ed podcast. And you probably know about this one because Rob told you about it. 
um, that list. And it was shared by so many people because I, I tag every podcast host and they like the recognition. So they shared it with their network and it, it got a tremendous reach, right? So this is something I look at. So like, how can I get outside of my network with my posts by tagging others? But I don't want to be creepy about it. I just want to tag people just be, just to get the reach. I want to bring value to them and then bring so much value to them that they're inclined to share my posts with their audience. You know, so that's kind of like the metric stuff I look at. Um, do people like it? Do people share it? Do people comment it? Do I get negative feedback in the comments? You know, this is something I got to look at too, because sometimes I approach my storytelling from a certain angle that it may upset somebody. So I want to make sure I don't do that again, even if I didn't think it was upsetting. But if a number of people feel the same way about my content, I'm like, okay, I need to pivot, right? I can't do that approach anymore. So you always, it's always in market. It's the beauty about marketing. You always, you adjust. You have to adjust all the time. You adjust to the market and to the beat of the market. Um, so that's those are the, like, like, like the metrics that I would look at. And you just want to make sure that yeah. you don't, you're not in an echo chamber, right? right you you right. are there. You got to see what's what clicks, what doesn't, what's trending. Absolutely. Well, I mean, and to your point, I mean, it's a it's a work in progress, right? That you have to continuously iterate. I mean, that's that's marketing in itself, right? Like summed up in um summed up in a sentence. But you said something earlier, which I thought was super interesting because we we all know people who do that on LinkedIn, and um, I I, I think it has a specific name, but they start tagging like everybody under the sun, right? And like, okay, Jeff Bezos, come on, like Simon Sinek, like way in here, right? Like, yeah, give us your two cents <laughs> worth. But I think uh, to your point, um, if you tag thoughtfully and meaningfully, which is what you were doing, obviously, right, by giving recognition to the podcast hosts, then you you might see better engagement. But if it's, but you know, people people can 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 see through um, you know someone's intentions if you're. If if you're just like trying to voice your opinion and you're trying to like uh, tag all the um, these 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 influencers out there, then uh, you know that that that's an exercise that could clearly backfire, right? Yeah, when somebody yeah. shows up in a comment section that brings no relevance to to it with their comments, and or yeah. or, or yet somebody uses their company page to to uh, write a comment about yeah. it get in front of this person's audience, it's like. I know what you're doing and it's yes. not going to work. So yes, it change absolutely. Your absolutely. And, and I'm glad you brought that up because it's a great segue into the next question. Okay. Get up on your soapbox here, man. What is a status quo in B2B storytelling that you passionately disagree with and why? It's all about the bottom line, man. <laughs> okay. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. It yeah, is. that's the that's the that's the status quo that I passionately disagree with because in today's um connection economy, you know, it's not all about the bottom line, man. It's about building connection, trust, familiarity, and establishing yourself as an ex uh, industry expert, um, which again increases trust with um potential clients. Now, sure, I'm not stupid. I know that there's some part about the bottom line because you got to keep the lights on at the end you know overall this is a it's a business you want to keep the lights on but if you're just concerned about the bottom line you know you come over pushy you come over desperate and then you come over annoying you know we all had this um connection request by somebody we're like oh new friend and all of a sudden you get um you get that that pitch from them i and am you're like, a bitch slap <laughs> it's like you didn't earn that, right? You didn't build a connection with me. I right. didn't uh, give you permission to pitch me. Like, what what makes you think that you can just pop into my messaging and and, and try to pitch me without getting to know me, getting to know, know my needs? So absolutely, absolutely. This disconnect right there, you know, it's yeah. like yeah. working. So um, so make sure it's all about the customer, knowing their pain points, and once you have figured that out, and you build a relationship with them. Like we do right here, I can't just mm -hmm. ask you to come on your podcast if you don't know me. We built a relationship yep. before, um, yep. you know, and and hopefully I brought some value to your uh, audience and to, to your life um, the short amount of time that we met each other, uh, known each other. So that's the way you want to go about it, uh, you know, build relationship. It's not all about the bottom line, I understand. 
it is in some point because you got to run a business and you got to play your employees, but don't come over desperate, you know, Absolutely. build a relationship first, and then go from there. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, that's a, that's such a great point. And, and I mean, you know, one of my all time favorite pitch slaps are the ones that they, they, uh, they send out this message under the pretext that they're trying to like, they're interested in what you do, or they're trying to, they're trying to find some way to collaborate uh, with you to a certain degree. But then when you start reading between the lines, it, it really is just a veiled uh, pitch slap, right? Yeah. So it's yeah. just, it's just them trying to sell their product under a false pretext of actually being interested in your company, which um, turns out they're not interested in you at all. All right. They, they just, they're just trying to hit their quota. Right. And exactly. uh, yeah, so there's plenty of that stuff out there, but um, Chris, thank you so much for coming on the show and uh, you know, for uh, sharing your expertise and uh, experience with the audience. So a uh, quick intro to yourself and uh, how folks out there can get in touch with you. Und ich habe um, ein paar Gerüchte gehört, dass du uh, auch Deutsch sprechen kannst. <laughs> yeah. Ich spreche auch Deutsch, vielen Dank. Uh, so I'm a, a bilingual German yeah. and uh, English, born and raised in Germany and, um, you know, moved out west to find the American dream, which I, which I did. Um, also recently made a career change from the legal industry to um, tech marketing. So I'm currently the marketing specialist at Hannon Hill, uh, makers of Cascade CMS, a content management system. And as well, we have a product called Clive that's um, a personalization tool uh, that integrates with any content management system out there to share or target content to a specific audience so each visitors that comes to your website actually gets the the content that's most relevant to them not just mm -hmm. stale generic content cool. you can get in touch with me on linkedin i'm big on linkedin um like to create there so chris raposo on linkedin or send me an email at chris.raposo at hannonhill.com that's h-a-n-n-o-n h-i-l-l dot com fantastic fantastic so once again chris thanks so much for your time take care stay safe and uh, talk to you soon yeah thanks for having me it was a pleasure all right, all right. bye for now